Father, this moment we are standing in your presence with the attitude of gratitude, Lord, for keeping us safe and sound. When we, when we look around, Lord, everywhere sickness, disease, and <coughs> death, that's what we hear about. But you kept us safe till now. Lord, we remember our members who are affected by COVID and our family members and friends and the people of our country. Lord, we need your healing in this land. We ask you to show your mercy and set us free from this pandemic. As we are going to spend an hour of time in your presence, meditating your word, Lord. Lord, I pray your spirit's leading may be granted to us and we may be able to perceive and receive what you want to communicate to us, Lord. Speak to us through your servant to submit this time and to thy throne of grace, asking, asking for your mercies so that we may be able to hear your voice. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Praveen, for leading us in that prayer. Like I mentioned last time, uh, we are going to deal with uh, marriage today and I titled, titled it The Christian View of Marriage or you could say Biblical View of Marriage. It's one of the questions in our uh, booklet uh, which we have been following but I thought I'll take a more um, probably a more uh, basic view of marriage. So I was, when I started preparing for this study, I we had to realize the marriage of, I mean, sorry, the subject of marriage is so vast for one session of Bible study. There is so much we can talk about in terms of marriage. Uh, the Bible does uh, bring in various elements, various dimensions to it. So uh, maybe we can look at some of the other, you know, the various other dimensions in future studies. But for today's session, I'm just going to stay with the preliminary, or you could say the primary issues of marriage, the, the basic questions that are being asked, uh, which continues to be debatable. You know, lots of people have views on uh, all of these very basic perspectives on marriage. Unfortunately, in today's uh, content, contemporary situation and the way people are thinking, a lot of thorny questions uh, have been raised. So let's see, some of it can, you know, will be brought by me today. And some of it, we can leave it for another time. Okay, so let's begin with the most basic of question. Uh, and that is, how did this institution originate? Uh, what is the, you know, who created marriage? Is it man who has uh, thought of the institution of marriage? Uh, is it man who for his convenience sake brought in the uh, perspective of marriage because we are male and female? Or does the institution of marriage have uh, a, a, a spiritual dimension to it. In other words, is it ordained of God? It is, is it created by God? And so the biblical view, let me present that right away. The biblical view, as many believe, it is not a man-made institution. Uh, but most Christians believe that it is a, uh, you know, institution ordained by God. Now, the, the problem here is there is no clear statement in the scriptures, in the Bible, that, you know, very plainly states that marriage is created by God or the institution of marriage is ordained by God. There is no clear statement. Like in so many issues in the Bible, there are no clear statements to this. So we have to infer it. Uh, infer it from the statements and what we read in the scriptures. Okay, so if, the, if we believe that the institution of marriage is created by God, uh, where would we go? Which scripture would we refer to? 
I did a study in the book of Genesis, and that's where we know that, you know, Adam and Eve came together and, uh, you know, they became one and all of that. Um, but there is, uh, you, you know, it's very difficult to prove that God is the one who created the institution. So I went to Matthew chapter 19, and I'm going to read uh, verses 4 to 6. Give me a moment as I open up the scripture here. I'm going to Matthew chapter 19. And remember, Jesus has something to say about marriage. And let us see what we can infer from there. Matthew 19, let's begin in verse 4. Now, this is, of course, he is, Jesus is responding to uh, the question some Pharisees asked, uh, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife on any ground? So the Pharisees uh, were very interested in, uh, you know, divorce. Uh, and so Jesus begins to answer that question. And in verse four, he says, haven't you read, he replied, that he who created them in the beginning made them male and female. So uh, right in verse 4, it is very clear that God created, uh, you know, uh, the genders. Uh, the genders come from God's express specific creation, male and female, okay? Uh, and notice it says in the beginning, or rather, uh, you know, uh, in the beginning, God created male and female. So here we have Jesus is going back to the very beginning. Now, verse 5 says, and he also said, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and the two will become one flesh. You will very clearly remember that uh, that's a quotation from Genesis chapter 2. Or so, uh, yeah, Genesis chapter two, uh, when Adam and Eve now come together, right? So Jesus is quoting straight away from the book of Genesis. Now, what can we learn from there? Notice it says, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be uh, joined to his wife. The word wife there is... Actually, in the Hebrew, uh, it is, now I, I'll find it very difficult to pronounce this, uh, Isha or something like that, I-S-H-S-H-A-H, -S -H -H. all right? Amir, thank you for joining in. Amir from Bangladesh is joining us. Thank you. Uh, good to have you with us. So, uh, yeah, we are reading from Matthew chapter 19, verse 5. So it says, a man will leave his father and be joined to his wife. But the word wife there is woman. A basic meaning of uh, the, the Hebrew is woman. Now, it can be used interchangeably for woman or wife. But the translators used wife. So they tend to say, well, yeah, I mean, the word wife means marriage. So God is the one who ordained it. All right. But... Uh, uh, th that becomes a poor argument because it mentions a woman, all right, not necessarily wife. Now, um, but in verse six, I think we can make it a little bit more uh, clearer or it becomes more clearer that this is talking about marriage. Verse six, notice it says, so they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together let no one separate. I like that, those particular words. What join? What God has joined together. So you bring in, you're, you're bringing in God there, and God is the joining, you know, uh, person. The God is the joining agent, if I, you know, for lack of a better word, uh, and the joining. The intention there is marriage. All right. The intention there is marriage. So uh, the union of this man and woman is how we understand marriage to be. And who has done it? God. So we are trying to answer the question, is marriage an institution created by God? 
Uh, is it an institution that is ordained by God and not man-made? And so Jesus is confirming it is God who is doing the joining. And so um, uh, we can very clearly see here that the context is about divorce. You remember Pharisees in verse 3 says, is it lawful to divorce? So the context is marriage and divorce. So Jesus is confirming that God is the one doing the joining. We can thus infer that God is the ordainer of the institution. God ordained uh, marriage as an institution. It is not man-made. Okay. And who is confirming this? Who is speaking here? There, there is no higher authority than Jesus. Right? Jesus is the one who is speaking in Matthew 19. And so he himself is confirming the fact that it was God who was doing the joining using the verse from the book of Genesis. So there is no higher authority than that. So I believe that it is Jesus' words in Matthew 19 that confirms that marriage is not a man-made institution, but he confirms the biblical view that marriage is a God-ordained and God-created institution. I'm going to leave it there. If you should have any questions, feel free uh, to bring it about in our discussions. Okay, so that is one very basic question uh, we can ask about marriage. All right, for those of you who have joined a little later, we are discussing the Christian view of marriage or what is the biblical perspective of marriage. Another point that we have to consider is marriage is between male and female. All right. <laughs> now, <laughs> the biblical view as most understand it is between male and female. And wow, that can, that can be a heated debate uh, because there are so many contrary views to that. And, uh, but I feel that we need to discuss it because <laughs> that is one of the more very primary questions that one can ask. If what is the biblical view of marriage? Is it between male and female or can you mix up the, you know, can you, uh, talk about same gender issues, yeah. Now, we are going to discuss this, and I, I would like to just mention that uh, in situations like this or topics like this, we need to discuss this without becoming condemned, right? Uh, very, very, you know, uh, it is very easy to start a uh, a discussion like this with a condemning tone. And I think that is not necessary. Uh, there are various points of view. People will disagree. Let us try to disagree without being disagreeable, right? That is how we many times uh, use that phrase. Uh, now, we can have very strong views about it. Uh, we, we can take a particular point of view, use the Bible to prove uh, 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 our point of view. The unfortunate thing is we can take the same Bible and prove some other point of view. Now, that is where the debate goes on. And I think uh, let's take an educated view and try to be as intellectually honest as possible to use the famous phrase of our elder Franklin Poppins, who has also joined us today. Thank you, Franklin. Okay, so we are talking about um, um, is marriage between male and female only? All right. The biblical view, like I said, is as much as I understand it, as much as we, as GCI understands it, is not between male and male, female and female. Once again, I'll go back to Matthew chapter 19. Let us see the words of Jesus. Um, Matthew 19, beginning in verse 4. Notice it says, Matthew 19, verse 4. Haven't you read? He replied that he who created them in the beginning 
made them male and female. Okay. Uh, I think that is fairly plain language. There is no intention to assume that, uh, you know, there is a, a, a gender problem there. It's very clear male and female, right? And so we could say Jesus is confirming the fact that there is male and female, uh, nothing to say, you know, the same gender situation being, you know, being assumed there. Okay, we'll, we'll leave it at, at that. Then. Let's go to verse 6, Matthew 19, verse 6. Here it says, so they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. So who has he joined together? Verse 4, male and female. So the joining is between male and female, as it is mentioned in verse 6, confirmed by Jesus. Right? Um, so there is no data there. There is nothing you can read between the lines to suggest that there is a same gender joining. All right? So you cannot take the words of Jesus or Genesis and say that, you know, uh, you can also assume that male and male or female and female can enter the institution of marriage. Now, uh, <clears throat> there are some objections that people bring. I felt that it would be good for us to look at some of those objections. You know, since we are doing a Bible study, uh, let's... Uh, Let's uh, take some of these objections. I've taken this from, I've taken some of it from uh, the, uh, the Gospel Coalition. Some of you may have heard the, T, the TGC in one of their articles written, uh, titled as The Bible and the Same-Sex Marriage, uh, Common but Mistaken Claims, right? They bring in the objections that people sometimes uh, state to say that the Bible is ambiguous and hence marriage does not necessarily have to be between male and female. It can also be of the same sex. The first objection is this, and I'm going to read uh, what the objection, as it is stated. Jesus in this objection says, didn't speak about same sex marriage, talking about Matthew 19. So he's at least neutral if not open to it, all right? uh, what Jesus doesn't condemn, we shouldn't condemn. So what this argument is, since Jesus didn't uh, speak about male and male, hence we can assume that it's okay. He's not condemning it. So we can assume that it's okay. So that is their argument. In other words, this argument is from what we call a silence. Uh, uh, this is just because the scripture doesn't mention the same sex uh, issue. Uh, so some people read into it by saying, since Jesus didn't mention it, hence he's not condemning it. But the problem here is that the silence is not in a vacuum, right? The silence is. Uh, in the context of marriage, once again, the discussion is, is divorce permitted? So the context is marriage. So the, uh, the, 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 the context being marriage, Jesus says male and female are being joined together. Now, if we say that from silence, we can argue that Jesus could also have meant male and male. Then there is, I believe, this is my argument, bestiality should also be allowed. You know what is bestiality? <laughs> um, bestiality is human beings having sexual relationships with an animal. There is no, there is silence about it in Jesus' words. So can we assume that bestiality is allowed? So I think there is a problem when we argue from silence with regards to that. Now, with regards to bestiality, 
uh, the book of Genesis and the book of Leviticus is very clear that uh, I'll just read you Genesis. It says, anyone who has sexual relationships with an animal must be put to death. I mean, that is how serious it is. So God does not permit uh, sexual relations with uh, hu between human beings and animals. Uh, but Jesus didn't mention it. So can we assume that Jesus is saying okay to it? Obviously not. Uh, I think uh, arguing from that silence is not correct. Okay, so I'll leave that there. Let me go to objection number two. The objection two is the Old Testament allows all sorts of prohibited marriages, including polygamy and what uh, would today qualify as incest, right? If those were permitted, surely mon uh, monogamous same-sex relationship should be allowed, all right? So the, uh, the, uh, the argument here is, if God has allowed polygamy in the Old Testament, why not he allow the same-sex marriages, all right? That's the argument. And of course, uh, they also talk about incest. If God allowed incest, I mean, to, in today's uh, terminology, incest would be marriage between very close relation, relations. And they say Genesis chapter 28 permits that. You remember Genesis chapter 28, Isaac told that his son must take a, uh, uh, get, your, uh, get yourself a wife uh, from the daughters of Lab Laban your mother's brother. So in Genesis 28, it allows marriage between uh, some very close relationships. So they are saying if that is allowed, uh, why not same-sex marriage? All right. Uh, okay. Now, how do you argue against that? Um, you had uh, same-sex I mean to say, you had polygamous marriages. Uh, so, um, the way I would look at it is this. What God allows is very different from what God intends. Now, what God wants or what God's will is. You see, God has allowed something which he never really intended. For example, divorce. God allowed divorce uh, because of the hardness of the heart. And once again, I'm presuming you remember those where those are mentioned. Uh, Jesus talks about that, uh, that Moses allowed divorce because of the hardness of your heart. So if God has allowed that, that does not necessarily mean God is permitting these things to happen or take place. Here, what we can just simply say is God many times does not interfere with man's choice. Right. Even if it is not good for him, sometimes God doesn't interfere. He allows man to make a choice. And, uh, and then, of course, unfortunately, pay the penalty for it or uh, the consequences of it. So objection to, to say that polygamy was allowed or incest, incestual marriage was allowed does not hold good to the fact that what God allows is God what is what God intended. That is, I think, a wrong uh, you know, conclusion to make. All right. So let's go to ob uh, objection number three. Objection number three is the old covenant is obsolete. And hence, so are its marriage prescriptions, right? We know, all know that the old covenant is obsolete. It has, uh, you know, been replaced by the new covenant. But I think what we were discussing so far very clearly shows that objection doesn't hold good. Uh, that doesn't hold good because Jesus Christ in Matthew 19 makes very clear his intentions with regards to marriage. All right. So uh, I don't think the old covenant, uh, you can cite the old covenant to say that since it's obsolete and hence all the, you know, uh, all the uh, 
what you say prescriptions in the old covenant are obsolete for example uh, the old old covenant says thou shalt not murder uh, <laughs> you cannot say well the old covenant is obsolete so i can own uh, you know a 10 round assault rifle and go and start killing people and uh, it's very unfortunate when you talk about assault rifles what's happening in the united states right and they just can't get around making a law uh, you know against these things but uh, once again that i think is very clear that doesn't really hold water okay um uh, objection 4 i'm looking at the time uh, uh looks like we won't get too far today but let anyway let's see how 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 far we can get objection 4 i take from an article written by focus on the family and uh, this is a very interesting objection that people bring uh and maybe i would like to hear some of your thoughts on it but this is the objection if god is both genders here an assumption being made Bo god is both genders some people believe god is male and female why um uh, we'll come to that but the question reads like this if god is both genders or contains both genders shouldn't shouldn't people be free to choose their own gender identity they say god is androgynous that is male and female at the same time right uh, uh if this is true wouldn't it further suggest that human beings made in his image have the prerogative of being either male or female or perhaps both male and female according to personal preference so you can begin to see how people are beginning you know phrasing these questions forming these questions because uh, the mind has really you know become so confused with the you know something like gender roles or or, or gender issues uh they are they are assuming so many things with regards to gender issues uh so if this is the case if they say god is androgynous male and female why um uh, because they say god made man in his image both male and female so they they believe that god must be male and female because his image is given to male and female and so they believe that god has to be male and female and so the argument is if that is the case uh what is wrong with same sex marriage you can choose your sex if you want to be male and you can marry another male right or you can be a female if you're a male and marry another female i mean this is the kind of argument that's going on the answer simply is let's attack the very first uh, you know first assumption god is neither male nor female <laughs> right um god transcends gender gender is of the created order gender is not something that is intrinsically uh prevalent in god right so to say god is androgynous is a complete uh, uh, mistaken conclusion from using the argument with regards to his image you see when it says that god created man male and female in his image it is indicative of the fact that man or mankind is uh is one the fact that male and female are created in god's image brings equality between man, male and female that's the argument i had used in the women's seminar that i had attended some time back i basically said that male and female uh, are we believe are equal in the eyes of god one is not superior to the other one is not a superior creation than the other so that is the argument that we can take away from with regards to uh, god's image right so uh, the differentiation of male and female is in the created order it is not in this in the 
spirit world and God is spirit. Okay. Uh, the, the image, uh, what we can say is that the, um, what do you say? Um, or rather the mistake is to think that the image has male and female characteristics. That's the mistake that people make, to think that the image of God has male characteristics and female characteristics. The scripture does not say that. Even though God uses metaphors of male and female, sometimes he can have a, a use of a female metaphor and say that, you know, like a chicken gathers its uh, chick or other hen gathers its chicken under, under its wings. So they can be female metaphors. But God is not female or male. Uh, it is humanity that is made in the image of God. And humanity is made male and female. Right? Not that God is male or female. So the characteristics which both male and female have are derived from God's character, which is his image. Once again, to make that clear, God has no biological sex and he because he's not material, right? Uh, he is he does not have genetic material. He does. He is not made up of uh, uh, the genome, right? He made us <laughs> with genetic material and hence uh, we can be made either male or female. OK, so I'm going to leave that question there i think uh, that is uh, you know sufficient material for us to understand that marriage is between male and female and all of the arguments that state that uh, you can have same sex or same gender marriages are not biblical all right if you should have any thoughts on that please feel free to share i'm going to i'm going to just deal with one more issue here and then stop for discussion. Obviously, I don't have time to move into the spiritual significance of marriage today. We will do that next time. One more question with regards to marriage here. Once again, biblical view of marriage. Marriage, as we understand it, is between one male and one female. Okay. In other words, sorry, men, polygamy is not allowed. And sorry, ladies, polyandry is not allowed. <laughs> Polygamy is uh, one man having multiple wives. Polyandry is one woman having multiple husbands. And that is not uh, allowed in the biblical perspective. Right? So how do you prove this? Is this biblical? Uh, Logically speaking, once again, uh, we can prove this. Once again, going back to the creation account, remember it says God made Eve out of Adam. All right, let's go back to the creation account. Uh, God did not make, taking out the rib from Adam, he did not make Eve, Evelyn, and Emily. Right? I hope you understand what I'm saying. He made Eve. He did not make two women or three women or four women. He made only one. Also from the creation account and from what Jesus said, Adam took Eve as his wife. He did not take Eve and whoever else as his wife. That's what that's the, uh, the biblical account. And it also says the two shall become one. How many shall become one? Two. Not three, not four. All right. Also, Matthew chapter 19, verses 5 and 6. We've already read that, but let me make an inference from there. Uh, Jesus says, a man shall be joined to his wife, and the two will become one. They are no longer two, but one. That is, the, that is what Jesus said. So Jesus confirms that he is basically uh, between one man and woman. Marriage is not between multiple partners. Okay. 
Now, the million dollar question, when you say that, what about Abraham? What about David? And of course, what about the record holder Solomon, who had 700 wives? Wow, can you? I mean, uh, this guy is just some, something. Huh? I mean, uh, 700 wives and 300, some would say porcupines, but. <laughs> um, so, why would God allow that? Once again, I go back to that argument which I made earlier. What God permits is not necessarily what God prescribes, right? Uh, in fact, God's perfect will was not multiple, you know, wives. Uh, he permitted it just as he permitted divorce, uh, but that is not God's perfect will. Uh, we have to distinguish uh, between accommodation, God's accommodation versus God's idea. But we have to make a distinction between the two. Perhaps you could also say God's patience is not God's permission, right? To allow so many uh, wives to take place. In fact, in Deuteronomy chapter 17, he specifically tells, you know, gives instructions to the kings of Israel. He says he must not, talking about leaders and especially kings of Israel, he must not take many wives. This is God's specific instruction, you know, to ancient Israel and their leaders. He must not take many wives or his heart will be led astray. He must not accumulate large amounts of silver and gold. He also talks about not taking too many horses and things like that. Right. So very clearly the instruction there is God's intention was never that marriage should be between multiple, you know, uh, wives or multiple husbands. If you come to the New Testament, qualifications for spiritual leaders, the Apostle uh, Paul uh, writing to Timothy and Titus, he says uh, the qualification for spiritual leaders is that you should be married to one wife. Obviously, it means that maybe there were people marrying multiple wives at that time, but he feels that that was not the idea. That was not especially that would disqualify one from becoming a leader. You know, in uh, as far as the Christian perspective is concerned. And if you look at the New Testament, there are all the instructions to husbands and wives are always singular in nature. How a man looks after the wife or how the wife behaves, behavior towards the husband, always singular. And so the, uh, the, uh, the assumption is it's always between one man, one male, one man and one wife. Now, uh, some, some people have tried to speculate as to why God may have allowed multiple wives. Uh, one speculation is that it says due to patriarchal societies, it was nearly impossible for an unmarried woman to provide for herself. Unmarried women were often subjected to prostitution and slavery. And so maybe God's permission or God allowing um, uh, one man to take uh, an extra wife or two wives, whatever, right? So uh, that is with regards to, uh, you know, marriage between, uh, marriage being between one male and one female, all right? So there are many more aspects to, uh, fundamental aspects to marriage. For example, a marriage is a contract, but it can also be, oh, sorry, uh, it, it's a covenant, but it also can be a contract. It, as far as today's situation is concerned, marriage can be both religious and civil. Uh, marriage cannot be between close family relationships. This is once again primary issues regarding marriage. Marriage is for life. In other words, uh, we believe uh, divorce is not something that uh, uh, the Bible necessarily recommends. Uh, and here is one marriage is sacred, but not a sacrament. The reason why we say that is, I think the Catholic view is that marriage is also a sacrament. Uh, I have not done much study in that, but uh, that is their official position. But I think from a uh, non-Catholic view or Protestant view, marriage certainly is sacred, but uh, we don't regard it as a sacrament. 
I wanted to get into the spiritual significance of marriage, but that we will keep it for the next time. So I'm going to stop there and invite some comments and questions that you might have. I'm sure you might uh, be able to uh, also, you know, reflect on some of the uh, objections that we discussed and maybe some of the uh, biblical assumptions that we are making, especially trying to assume from silence. So floor is open for your comments this time. Okay. Yes, Suramurthy, go ahead. Uh, you are muted. Surimurti, could you please unmute yourself? Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, I have in front of me the definition of incest. Definition of incest. Yes. Uh, it is a sexual relation between a, with a parent, with a child, with a sibling, with grandchild. So the marriage of Jacob to Laban's brother, Laban's daughter, is not so incest. Okay. Uh, you are saying that uh, this definition is uh, today's definition or is this a biblical definition? Yeah, today's definition. Okay. Okay. Yeah, quite possible. Yeah. I mean, uh, uh, some people some people have assumed that some of the biblical marriages were in, uh, incestual in nature uh, because it talks about close relationships. I think uh, uh, that is where the confusion is. What is close relationship? And you are saying that uh, is this a legal definition or is this a, a, a medical definition? Dictionary definition. Okay. <laughs> yeah. You know, uh, there is also a legal definition. There is also a medical definition. Sometimes your close relationship can have genetic, uh, what you call it, interactions, which can cause many problems. So uh, we'll have to look at a wider context. Yeah, go ahead, Suramurti. Go ahead, finish your talk. Today, in, nowadays, yeah. people have gone to the modern day Sodom. People have gone to the modern day Sodom and they have picked up the sulfur. The sulfur is of 99.5% purity. Why did God rain down sulfur on Sodom? Why did he do that? What was he against? Are you giving us the answer or you are just posing a question? Because if people say that homosexuality is all right, what was taking place in Sodom? What was God against? God was definitely against something. He was so furious that he rained down on Sodom the purest form of sulfur. Okay. He wanted to make sure that nobody is left alive. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. I think uh, if I can just interject here, Suri Murthy, uh, we are getting into a slightly different, uh, you know, uh, aspect. Uh, we are talking about homosexuality here, which is a maybe a, a subject of its own. Uh, maybe we can deal with it another time. My uh, my uh, focus is specifically marriage, biblical perspective of marriage. But yes, you have a point there. And uh, this study with regard to Sodom and Gomorrah is uh, very interesting, actually. I mean, there is a lot of research done there. And there are many, many, as usual, many perspectives and conflicting views. Maybe we can take that another time. Let's not get into a homo, you know, homosexuality as such. Let's remain with marriage. Is that okay? Uh, we touched upon the point during this uh, word. 
during your talk you yes yes you were talking you were touching upon subject absolutely yes i was i was but uh, you know uh, let's continue with that you know focus on marriage yes uh, pravin you are going to say have some thought yeah, go ahead uh, no it's just a scripture i would like to bring to your notice of course uh, with all uh, uh, conviction that marriage is between two people two persons only i mean male and female uh, there is one verse which is a little difficult where some people make i mean use it to speak about polygamy that is a uh, second uh, that that verse you can find in uh, uh, second samuel 12:8 in second samuel 12:8 where god uh, sp- i mean nathan speaks to david and nathan says i have given you everything i have given you your master's uh, uh, family i have given you your master's wife if you have asked me i would have given you much more yeah. <laughs> yes <laughs> so when we talk about uh, the law that was made and spoken for kings and these words how how we can uh, interpret and uh, help people to understand that yes uh, that's that is one of those uh, classified as difficult scriptures uh, what god meant when he said i would give you if you asked you know multiple wives uh, you know i mean uh, let's uh, obviously we can't do a study of that maybe we'll do a study of that you know uh, in the future uh, but if that is the case then uh, there is a contradiction not only in the bible but in god himself uh, and in jesus so obviously god did not mean uh, as as it is stated there is some other meaning to it and i think we should study that probably uh, since we are going to be dealing with marriage uh, and i'm going to bring in the spiritual perspective of marriage next time maybe we can bring in this and talk about it also because there is a way to interpret that pastor can i ask a question please hello vanessa good to see you yes go ahead okay uh, i want to know marriage now marriage has a meaning many meanings okay now marriage means when two people join together now they join together physically mentally financially means any one reason it doesn't have to be a physical reason so marriage means what, what is actually marriage supposing two people get married okay and they cannot hit it out okay so they are living separate but still nobody is committing a sin they are living their lives separately or whether they are staying together so actually what is the meaning of marriage okay uh, i uh, let me see if i understood your question your question was um uh, does marriage mean that somebody should live together physically Mm-hmm. uh and i think you're extending that to also mean that uh there has to be uh, this joining or coming together has to be emotional in nature uh am mm-hmm. i getting your question correct uh, mm-hmm. you know can you just clarify that for me yes yes uh when i say yeah go ahead Yes, that's what I'm asking. Marriage means two people living together, or or they can get married and live apart. It is <laughs> is it a sin to live apart if you're married? Okay, okay, okay. Now you are uh, okay. Now I think I understood the question. If you're married and living apart, is it a sin? Is that the question you're asking? Yeah. Okay. Now, uh, you know, because of circumstances, people can live. Uh, apart for example i know a couple a christian couple the wife i mean to say the husband is working here but the wife got a job in the us and she is in the us and this is for you know uh, for economical reasons and they i don't know this exact circumstances but they are still married they got children and they are uh, you know still considered married so because of circumstances if they are living separately that doesn't necessarily mean that it is it is a sin uh, okay but so, if uh, they have separated mm-hmm. if uh, they have uh, let's say well i mean let's use the word divorce if they are divorced 
that's a, that's a different that means they are no, no longer married mm -hmm. so if they are separated to the to the extent where it is it is it is considered a divorce then obviously they are no longer married mm -hmm. i mean i'm not sure if i answered it is, okay no if they are not divorced also if they are not divorced just just okay just living separate lives okay in in, in no way are they connected Now we don't. But still married. But still married. But just okay. living separately. Yeah, that's the point. Okay, I, I'm I'm presuming that uh, the separation. I mean, we have to determine the reason for separation. Is it, uh, you know, a temporary separation? Is it uh, what you say uh, for a particular reason, like economic reasons, or moving to another place? uh the reason will have to be determined to establish the fact whether they are still married or not all right uh mm -hmm. so uh if you um if you are separated with the intention of not wanting to get together again uh, that separation is almost final and i'm presuming that that the marriage is dissolved there once again uh, there are so many issues there <laughs> uh, we'll have to uh, discuss you know specific issues before we come to a conclusion okay so marriage is only if if you uh, if you have to know why you why you are married or having a not then then it is a sin if you are separate okay in in the bible if i if i talk about the bible So, if you cheat on your partner once, then it's a sin. Otherwise, no. Okay. Uh, yes. Vanessa, for <laughs> sorry, Vanessa. For some reason, your voice has been breaking up, so I couldn't catch you very clearly. But if I can just say that uh, if two people are married, they consider themselves married. There is no reason for them to live apart, unless. the reason is like what we discussed you know uh, a little earlier <laughs> right that what is the reason for them to live apart other than you know having to move to another country or <laughs> let's say uh, <laughs> there is a, a a physical disability like somebody is uh, uh, one spouse is admitted to in a nursing home for long term care Uh, for something, see those reasons are perfectly valid and doesn't dissolve the marriage. Okay, but but I mean, marriage doesn't necessarily mean that the couple has to be together. No, it's not necessary. <laughs> in why get married? <laughs> in by in the Bible, in the Bible, it is not written that when two people get married, they have to live together. No. Well, once again, uh, we can we can assume. <laughs> the intention of the scripture when it says you shall leave your father and mother be mm -hmm. joined to your wife and the mm -hmm. two shall become one the intention there is that you are married to live together means <laughs> <laughs> to look after each other <laughs> yeah anil has a thought anil go ahead no i thought see the marriage basically means committed to one another and that means you're marrying because you know you want to be together you want to take care of one another love one another and all that now how do you do that while living separately unless you know there are extenuating circumstances but mm -hmm. otherwise what's the point of getting married if you're saying well we are married but you know we don't live together we don't love one another we go our separate ways we but we are married that doesn't make sense <laughs> yeah yeah i don't know <laughs> but i have another question not related to this yeah but you mentioned that uh, uh god is neither male nor female he has no gender is there any uh, uh, biblical support for that specifically is there any scripture which mentions this or hints towards that or is just because he is spirit there is no uh, gender uh yeah i mean i think uh, the 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 obvious answer is there is no particular scripture that says god is male or god is female uh the point i was making is some people think that since god made man in his image 
and he made them male and female, they assume that God is both male and female, androgynous. Uh, and I think that is a wrong conclusion. Uh, uh, God's image is given to male and female. Uh, he is not male and female creating male and female. So that is the distinction I was making. Uh, and uh, God is, uh, once again, um, you know, uh, we'll have to look at some scriptures that uh, indicate that the intention is that God is neither male nor female. So remember, you had a thought on that? Yes. Jesus said, Jesus said in the resurrection, they will not be marrying. That is, there, there will be genderless. Mm -hmm. And angels in heaven. So, if the resurrected human beings are genderless, we can presume that even angels and God, they are genderless. <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> I would think that uh, that can be debated. Uh, you know, some people also use what is mentioned. I think uh, the Apostle Paul mentions, is it in Galatians where he says, uh, there will be no uh, Jew, Gentile. There will be no slave nor free. There will be no female or male. Uh, I presume some people take that. That will be genderless. You know, in the kingdom, we will all be genderless. Uh, I'm not so sure if that is what it means. Uh, I, uh, that is probably more towards to speaking towards the fact that there will be equality and there will be no discrimination between male and females, just as there is a, you know, one is superior in terms of uh, slave and free. So genderless uh, is a big question mark there. Anybody have any thoughts on that? I haven't uh, looked into this particularly. Uh, Praveen, you had a thought on that? Yes, go ahead. Yeah, uh, especially when we talk about gender, gender is something that uh, which is given to uh, given to us by God, which reflects His image. Uh, he that does not mean uh, he he has both the male and female within himself. It is not at all talking about it. It is talking about uh, only one thing. He is Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. They are interconnected in fact they are in each other god uh, father is in the son son is in the father when it comes to us gender is the only place where we can see man is in the woman and woman is in the man in the creation of uh, uh, adam and eve uh, there we can clearly see adam was there in adam itself eve was already there then god separated adam and eve then through eve every adam has come so this is speaking about uh, the perichoresis relationship, which we are talking about God. Father is in the Son, Son is in the Father, they are in the Holy Spirit. They are uh, in, in, interdwelling in each other, in their very existence itself. The same way, Father cannot be Father without the Son, Son cannot be Son without the Father. What is that? Uh, how, how is that we can see in gender? Man, okay, there is no point in qualify. I mean, uh, saying a man is a man if there is no woman. So woman is the one who qualifies the, the so-called gender of man. And uh, man is the one who qualifies the so-called gender of female. So they qualify each other. They are uh, in, in their very existence. They cannot be separated. So in the very existence of God, God cannot be separated. Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, they can never be separated. The singularity, plurality, how it can be interconnected and interdwelling in a physical form, in a human form, to reflect it, that image has been given to us. That is what we are calling gender. So it does. we can never interpret the reality through the image. We always need to interpret the image through the reality. So when we talk about uh, gender and say God is both male and female, or even saying God doesn't have any gender, these all these things are uh, called anthropo anthropomorphism. We are looking at man and whatever is not man, we are projecting on God. Or we are looking at man 
and whatever we become, we feel the perfect man is and whatever the qualities we have of in men men that we are projecting on god way in terms of gender as well so this is anthropomorphism this is not theology that is uh, that idiosity we can say okay so uh, this gender is something a great thing that god has given to us no angels no uh, i mean god at all, when we talk about these two we don't find anything about gender it is because gender is also one of the most important thing used for repro uh, reproduction god god is complete he is not going to be increased more so there is no necessity for any gender within him and god is not interested in reproducing in angels that's why we could not find anything in that but when it comes to men when it comes to animals when it comes to fishes and birds and uh, trees god literally used the word saying the saying go fill it, fill the earth you know multiply and for us he said rule the earth apart along with the multiplying it okay so only for we creation he had given us the privilege of reproducing and becoming more and multiplying that is the reason <coughs> gender also given to us so ultimately when we talk about gender we should not consider it a god as both male and female or he is not any of those he is uh, he is out of this discussion actually the reflection of his sing a singularity plurality and inter Uh, connectedness or interdwellingness so the pedocrosis we are calling that is reflected through this and one last statement i would like to uh, make about uh, uh, this particular words where it said uh, uh, in the eternal life or in the age to come we shall be like angels where we where we would not be marrying this and that so this is in answer to various uh, sexual immoralities and various issues that we are facing in marriage in the human life jesus was answering when pharisee or somebody said uh, sorry sadducee comes and says a woman married seven people whose wife she is going to be so these are the difficulties we have in a human life so when when jesus said uh, in the days to come or in the eternal life uh, you will be like angels you shall you will not be marrying and all that does not disqualify or that does not remove our gender in even the age to come when that is a very thing that reflects the image of god god will continue having it having it with us he is not going to remove in fact he is going to conform us to that image i personally feel in the age to come we now we are suffering all the broken marriages in the age to come we are going to experience the perfect marriages just like how god is there in god is perfect in his relationship as father son and the holy spirit uh, so uh, it is not removing uh, gender things and all but uh, it is it is we are not going to be making life so complicated with all those things it is going to be free i i, I feel that is the better way to take that words okay i think uh, uh... this is uh, something that uh, needs revisiting probably probably we will try to make it a little bit more sharper but franklin you had a thought yes sir uh, i have two questions for you sir yes one is a simple and one is a solid <laughs> okay so the simple question is uh, why are governments legalizing same sex marriage and the more solid question is how on earth can any church solemnize same sex marriage <laughs> okay uh, uh what we'll do is since we have uh, uh, overshot our time today we are going to revisit the subject uh and we will take up some of these questions and uh, also i want to finish what i had prepared for you so next week let's continue the discussion and uh, there are some you know uh, fairly difficult passages in the bible maybe we'll visit some of those uh which can be very helpful so keep thinking about marriage again so we'll come back to it and uh be able to talk about it okay thank you so much for joining us it's a pleasure to have you join as well as uh your participation questions that you asked uh thank you for uh keeping the interest and of course uh, the discussion uh i think we learn so much when we talk with each other uh so let us end with a prayer and and uh, we have a request uh, amio since you're joining us uh, would you like to close in prayer for us please thank you
Let's pray. <clears throat> Father God, we really thankful for this uh, wonderful time you have given today uh, for discussing about the biblical marriage. Father, it was really uh, truthful and thoughtful uh, discussion, question and answer. Also, it is from your uh, scripture that man and woman, they are become one. This is the commitment what you give us. Father, you bless all of us here and also all of our church members, even also who <coughs> have the problem even in their uh, relationship between the husband and wife, you build them a good intimacy between them and also with you, Father. Thank you for this time and also bless Pastor Danny Zakaria and also all of the members here today and also who uh, not able to join this meeting, you also bless them also. You bless this night and protect us from all these pandemics. This pray, Lord Jesus Christ's name. Amen.